This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, Mark Wayne Mullen, I have questions. Do you have answers? No, but I can make it sound good. Okay, well, we're going to do our absolute level best here because I don't know if you know this, but breaking news, you are supporting a convicted felon for president of the United States. And you were one of the earliest supporters and you came out whenever there were, you know, 20 people running in the race. Well, actually you came out before there was even anybody in the race and you you came out for Donald Trump, but gosh, darn it. I I keep hearing that if I vote for him and support him. Yeah. I believe in second chances. (laughs) I think anybody can, 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 uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Can, rehabilitate <laughs> yeah yeah he, he maybe he can be rehabilitated back yeah, into no, society it's a, yeah it, it's such a joke right i mean you you pick a district to to to, to convict him in uh and in a district that six percent literally six percent of the population voted for him so it's the same thing in georgia you know when they took him to court in georgia they said well he was convicted in georgia they were convicted in the only county in georgia that didn't support him <laughs> the only county. I mean, they have all these counties in Georgia, and they picked the one in Atlanta that didn't support him. So you you just you know you just shake your head at this. The whole point, and it wasn't to send. It's not to send Trump to jail either. It's because they want to run ads saying he's a convicted felon. Literally yep. the night of the conviction, people were taglining uh, the you know these these DC talk shows. And uh, these political insiders were tagging him as a convicted felon. Uh, immediately, the talking point shifted about a convicted felon. It's just, an, it's just a joke. And the American people see right through it, And which is why, you know, he raised $250 million within the first five days after the election with 70% brand new donors, first time donors. That's un, That's unheard of, Kyle. That's just crazy how much he raised. He literally smashed every fund rate, uh, fundraising record that's ever been set. He did it, and he didn't have to do one thing. The Democrats did it for him. One one thing that I thought was interesting is if you didn't think that this was a ploy, they gave you a hint, and it was subtle. But every time you see somebody, like usually a politician, whenever they're giving some sort of address to the media, and then as soon as they're done with the address, there's usually five or six different voices of journalists that are like speaking up all at the same time to try to get their question in. Trump comes out after being convicted on all 34 counts. He comes out there. He does his little two-minute thing for the media and turns around to walk away. And only one voice, and it was the voice of a female journalist. I don't know who it was. She just goes, you know, basically, Mr. President, uh, why do you think the American people should vote for a convicted felon? And it was just like, okay, there there had to have been dozens of reporters there, dozens and dozens. And you're telling me that they were all just completely perplexed by what the president was going to say, that they couldn't think to just throw their question out there. And only one gal had her, you know, bullet ready to go in the gun. It's like, come on, you knew this was a game from the beginning. Yeah, well, they did. And and uh, and, but I think even a journalist, if that's what you can call some of the reporters right now, which I mean, listen, a lot of the. I will say this. A lot of people in the press corps that follows the president and follows that inside, uh, the you know, kind of inside the beltway, that you have a lot of actual reporters. I mean, I mean that sincerely. You, you have your you have your outliers, but you have your outliers on any team. But for the most part, I think those reporters that were, uh, you know, in this press corps, they were as shocked by what had just happened as anybody except that one, which is that one's that outlier, uh, because they understood what just happened to the American political system when they did that. It was devastating. And then they, then, then you got to go, are they really going to put sin into prison? How can that even take place? You cannot send a former president of the United States to prison. And because the national, I mean, because our, our secret service is to protect him the rest of his life. So they're going to have to go to jail too. I mean, right. they're going to be there. Uh, so, I mean, I, and who knows what happens? I mean, if you're, if you're, I don't know if you're going to ask me, you know, what do you think is going to happen January 11th or July 11th? I don't know what's going to happen July 11th, but I would, I, I, if they do anything, they would try doing something like maybe a house arrest, which all that means is Mar Largo would be the biggest fundraising crowd you'd ever see. And a lot of people would be flying to Florida. That'd expand the airport there. Yeah. I mean, we'll see uh, with what the judge decides. It seems like if you're going to go, you know, if you're going to go fully down this road, you're not going to stop short of doing prison time. Like it would make no sense to really do this whole charade and then stop short of prison time. But uh, the the question that I do have about this and that is I've expressed on my show is, okay, 
So he's got this case, but then he's got the Atlanta case, the one in Georgia that you talked about. He's got the case in D.C. and he's got the case in Florida. And they all have, you know, their different merits or non-merits or different things like that. And they all have their different schedules and all that. So it would seem apparent that if he is elected in November, which the polls right now suggest that he's, you know, the the Vegas odds are in his favor. between Joe Biden and Trump, Trump wins this election. So let's say that happens. I feel like the entire term, Mark Wayne, is going to be bogged down with either the initial trials in the Florida, D.C. and Atlanta cases or then the subsequent, you know, retrials or uh, all these different things. It's like, how could he focus on what's going on in the country if he's in court? All Actually, the time? They, would, they would all go away. They may try to do Democrats will try to do another stuff, but they'll all go away because he can pardon himself. <laughs> so, but, but not pointless. on the state crimes. He can do it on the, the federal stuff, but not on the he, state crimes. He, the governors are going to pardon him. They will go away. I'm telling you, they, as a president, they will, they, will, they will go away. They'll still try to come after him. But they, the whole point was the whole point was to, to try to break him, um, to try to, to make him actually spend so much of his time dealing with these court cases that he couldn't campaign and that all his money and resources be used for that. I talked to President Trump and he said he had over 200 attorneys working for him full time right now uh, because all these cases is coming after him. What they didn't understand is the resilience of the man. And you don't even realize it bothers him. He just he understands what's happening and he just continues to move forward. And so when he gets elected again, all these frivolous cases against him, they will they will they'll go away uh, because they're they're the cases are are weak and it's just a, they're they're the, they're ploy by these Democrat prosecuting attorneys and these Democrat attorney generals uh, are they they've lost they're you're you're gonna you're gonna really risk your career on taking then the seating president of the United States to court and you think you're going to win you think you're going to have a case there zero chance yeah i mean i wish i was as confident as you with that because i feel like they are petty enough to do that exact thing to where it's like if they're going to try to get him as former president trump why wouldn't they want to get him as again president trump but uh, the thing that we're seeing now is there's so much momentum on the trump side Obviously, none of his poll numbers came down. If anything, they went up uh, nationally, and certainly we see that in all the swing states because we know this election is going to come down to you know tens of thousands of people in like four or five or six different states. That's what the election comes down to. But then we see the Biden administration saying, you know what, we want to do a debate. But they're not going to do these debates that are like really close to when the election is going to happen in November. They want to do them a little bit early. So the first debate is coming up here really in the next couple of weeks, and – uh, there's all kinds of stipulations. There can't be a crowd. They're going to cut off microphones. There's two commercial breaks, uh, which is not really standard for something that you would see here. So do you have a read on how Donald Trump's going to be approaching the debate? Because the concern is, is no one expects anything from Joe Biden. So if he shows up even mildly sentient, he technically wins. And so we don't right. want to set the expectations too low. But what are your thoughts on how this is going to play out? Well, I, I think it, it, first of all, you, you got an election, you got a, a, a um, a, a presidential debate that's going to actually happen before each one of them is actually nominated to right, be. Right, which is ridiculous. Uh, yeah, it, that's never happened, right? We've never had that. And which I think the Democrats are doing that because the Democrat Party is taking on a tremendous amount of water right now, and they want to try doing something to give Biden a bump. So he Biden's going to come in prepared. And, and there was very low expectations, Kyle, during the State of the Union. If you remember during the State of the Union, I mean, right. people were expecting nothing. And he actually did. As much as I hated sitting there listening to this guy, um, he actually did a good job. I mean, as, not, not his policies, but I'm talking about like his demeanor and the way he delivered his message. Not that I liked his message, He the way he – but he was cognitive. He was witty. Uh, he shot back at some you know some of the hecklers out there. So you can't underestimate his ability to come out and perform after they, you know, prop him up and on a bunch of B12 and might have indeed. You just mm. you just can't. But I believe they're doing this debate so early so they can try to mitigate some of the damage. And if the damage, if he does horrible, then that even adds more fuel to my fire about saying that, you know, there's a good chance. I think there's a 50 50 chance that he gets replaced at the Democrat National Convention because of his health. And so they were, they will release the delegates at that point and try to pick somebody else, which is, you know, we can go down that rabbit trail if you, if you choose. But as far as the debate stage is the way it's set up. I think it actually works in President Trump's favor that they're going to mute the mics because uh, it, it, we all get caught up in a moment that we just want to, you know, shoot back. And when someone's not being truthful and the idea that he can't, I think that I, I think that actually helps because the more Biden speaks, the more opportunity you give him 
to have another meme floating around. And so the, the, the more opportunities they can give him to talk without being interrupted, I think is a positive thing. So I think the debate, uh, the way they've set the debate up is, is not a, is not what the American people would like to see because we'd like to see the back and forth. That's why we, you know, we like, we watch, we pay pay per view to, to watch mixed martial arts fights, right? And we overpay mm-hmm. for them. Uh, and they keep going up and yet we still keep buying them yep. because there's a reason why we, we find it entertaining. It's the same thing when a debate, this first debate, a lot of people are going to watch and they would love to see the back and forth and the bickering and fighting. Uh, at the same time, you're not going to see that, but I, I think it's actually a positive thing. Hey guys, real quick here recently, one of my family members was telling me about how they partnered with another family and they bought some beef from this local cattle producer. And when they got the beef, it was unbelievably terrible. And I can tell you this from experience because they made me some beef ribs from that animal and they were terrible. And they even gave me some steaks and some ground and it was basically inedible. I like, I couldn't believe how bad it was. And they ended up finding out that the person killed an old bull or something like that. And just the meat was old and tough and awful. And that's just what happens when you don't have a quality cattle operation that you can trust to give you a quality beef product on the back end. And that's, guys, why I want to introduce you to the official beef delivery partner of Undaunted Life, my friends at Primal Beef. So Primal Beef is a cattle operation owned and operated by Sean Glass. He's a retired Navy SEAL that has partnered with Jocko Willing to launch Primal Beef. So... What makes Primal Beef different from some of these other cattle operations where you're going to end up getting bad beef? This operation is all American Black Angus cattle. The beef comes from one farm, and that's in Virginia Shenandoah Valley. The beef is all natural, no hormones ever, no mRNA ever, no vaccines ever. And after slaughter, this is a big deal. The beef is dry aged, and then it's hand cut by artisan butchers and then flash frozen to ensure that it maintains tenderness, marbling, and flavor. And here's another great thing about it. For every box sold, Primal Beef donates meat directly to a member of America's Special Operations Forces through the C4 Foundation. So you can take pride knowing that your purchase will help to put literal food on the table for America's finest warriors. If you're not salivating yet, It's probably because you're a communist. Don't be a communist. Try Primal Beef out today by going to www.primalbeef.com. That's primalbeef.com. Use the promo code Kyle, that's my first name, to get 10% off of your order. The great thing about that promo code is you can stack that on other deals as well and get all this money off. Again, that's primalbeef.com, promo code Kyle, that's K-Y-L-E, to get 10% off your order. Okay, so uh, you said it was you know basically a coin flip as to whether or not he would make it, but I do want to go down that rabbit trail just a little bit because where it stands right now is it seems like okay if they say look the he's he's dying in the polls polls he's literally dying in front of our eyes, but what do we do because if you if you take Kamala Harris out then you're taking away the the whole reason he wanted to pick her in the first place is that she's an intersectional candidate, right? Because she's black and she's female or part black and female. And so the thing is, is like, who exactly do you replace him with? Because one of the only national politicians with a lower approval rating than Joe Biden is Kamala Harris. So what exactly would they do? Well, so it, there's two things that happens when, when you go to, to the debate, to the national convention, which there's actually rumors saying that he may be nominated before the convention even takes place. Right. Uh, because of I forget what state it is that has to have it done before then because of the the ballot issue, and uh, and so I, um and so this may be mute at that point. But if they go to the convention and he releases his delegates, remember delegates are typically your activist. So the activists in the Republican Party and the activists on the Democrat Party, where your activists kind of kind of attend, not all, but kind of tend to to go to the far fringes of your party. So now keep that in mind because they can't elect somebody that is farther to the left than Joe Biden. So that's why Kamala's numbers are worse than his. Governor Newsom's numbers are worse than his. And and actually Michelle Obama's numbers are worse than his. But if you're allowing your delegates to pick that person, that's exactly the way they may go. And then it defeats the purpose of letting Joe Biden go, because if you're going to let Joe Biden go, you want somebody more presumed to be moderate. There is no moderate national Democrats left, by the way. That doesn't exist. But I'm just saying presumed to be moderate. And if that's the I mean, so it's kind of. You you lose control of the convention really, really, really quick if you actually do this. So that's why I'm not convinced they're going to do it, but I think it's a 50-50. If I were to say who they would like to see get out there is they would have to bypass 
uh, Harris, and they would probably lean towards Hakeem Jeffries. Hakeem Jeffries is now the leader. She's the one that replaced mm. Nancy Pelosi. And the reason why I say that is because I think they've been playing this for a little bit. And the night that Kevin McCarthy was sworn into office, when he actually, uh, and not sworn into office, but took the took the speaker gavel, uh, that gavel wasn't uh, Hakeem Jeffries to give. That gavel was actually Nancy Pelosi's to give. Uh, Hakeem never had the gavel. Why did they choose to have Hakeem Jeffries hand the gavel to him? I don't know. And why did they give him 15 minutes to do a campaign speech? I don't know. But since Hakeem's been there, now this is a leader of the House who Nancy Pelosi was always with Joe Biden. No mm -hmm. one can point to one single, pic one single picture that Hakeem has been pictured with um, President Biden since he's since Hakeem's been leader of of the House, which is really odd to me. Um, you you see Hakeem. I served with Hakeem. Hakeem is not a moderate individual. He's he's very liberal, but he's worked with Speaker Johnson and Speaker McCarthy on l multiple pieces of legislation. Which he's not the bipartisan person. I, I I'm telling you, I worked with the guy. Why does he do that right now? Why is he taking different stances against the White House on some national issues, including the border and including uh, in which that wasn't his position before this woke movement? He's actually came against it. He was part of the woke movement before. Why is he taking positions against this pro-Palestinian uh, movement when and before that would have been kind of an, a way he would have went because he was he was liked by the squad and he's taken a different opinion from there. Now, all that stuff starts playing in my head going that that seems odd that they would be setting this guy up for that and then if you start looking at national news um all your major networks abc nbc and cbs their nightly move or their nightly news has 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 come out and done a um a, you know a special on hakeem jeffries lately you had 60 minutes you had dateline and whatever the one is on abc they all did uh, they all did specials on getting to know hakeem jeffries so I, I think that's where the Democrat Party is trying to get to, but it's still a huge risk if you do that at the convention, because once again, once you release the delegates, they can go wherever they want to go. Yeah, so we've got a few weeks to see how this all sorts itself out. I gotta say, it's it's gonna be like uh, it's gonna be high drama in a lot of different ways. But you know, when you see our president at the you know G seven and different places where yeah. he seems to be just wandering off and doesn't seem to be doing things uh, that are you know <laughs> consistent with having you know your entire mental faculties, that becomes problematic. But then you see policy things that he's doing that seem desperate, seeming like he's trying to appeal to certain voters in certain areas. So obviously, the anti Israel stuff that he's doing, uh, it seems to be you know promoting and trying to get uh, on the good graces of certain people in Dearborn, Michigan. But then you have this new stuff that he's talking about with doing amnesty with uh, well, essentially it would be amnesty for these people that have been in the country illegally for more than 10 years, but they're married to an American citizen, basically fast tracking them to getting legal status here in this country. And a lot of people are seeing that as just kind of like a last minute, you know, last ditch effort to get uh, more Latino uh, people to vote for them. But then when you see the polling for black Americans, Latino Americans, they seem to be polling incredibly well for Donald Trump significantly significantly better than even they came out in 2016 for him. And so what's your read of what we're going to be seeing over these next several months? Because it just seems like desperate attempt after desperate attempt to just get a few hundred votes here and there. Well, it's, it's, they're, they're trying to, they're trying to mitigate the bleeding. Uh, it's, it's true. What you said, the Hispanic vote has greatly um, uh, diminished in the, in the Democrat party and has continued to increase underneath the, Re the Republican party. A lot of that is their own doing, right? Um, a, a lot of these individuals that are seeing the lawlessness taking place in our country, they left countries like that. They didn't want to live underneath that. That's what called a third world country. The lawlessness versus respecting the rule of law is what separates a third world country and, and the United States. And so these individuals that have migrated here uh, legally, they're, and that are legally here to be able to vote, they're going, we don't, we don't. We're, we're, we don't want this. We've we've left dangerous cities right. before where our families wasn't safe, where we wasn't safe. And, and and so that's one reason why they're moving. The second thing is the family traditional values, Hispanic population. They embrace um, you know, their, their their religion and they were they they family values and family uh, um, makeups are very important to them. Right. And so those traditional family values are highly important. The Democrat Party has completely annihilated the traditional family values. And and so they've they've done it themselves. They pushed people away. The working class is no longer represented by the Democrat Party. The Republican Party is representing the, Demo the working class. That's a lot of the immigrant families and the Hispanic 
communities. And so you're you're trying to see them appease the, the, that, that portion of the population by going at sticking points like giving amnesty to these individuals. The problem that you do that with is when you do a blanket amnesty, you still don't know who these individuals are. There is no vetting process of them. And when you're saying when you're saying that you're going to give amnesty to these individuals that's been here for X amount of time and they're married to an American citizen, you're not talking about just individuals from, from Mexico. You're talking about individuals from the Middle East. And there's a huge difference between a female living here that has a husband that's here illegally and the mentality to which that brings. And I'm, I'm from someone that spent a lot of time in the Middle East. I'm not, I'm not, I, I am being very geographic by saying what I'm saying is because of the, there's, we all make decisions based on two things, the way we're raising our life experiences and the way they're raising our life experiences prior to the United States is quite different. You need to know who these individuals are. You're not talking about just simply one demographic of people. You're talking about, we have, we have, we've had over 160 different nationalities caught on our Southern border and you're giving a blanket amount of amnesty to those individuals when we already know we just caught eight to Chikistan ISIS-K members planning a terror attack inside the United States. We know that we've already apprehended over 340, actually it's over 350 known terrorists on the watch list on our southern border. How many hundreds of others are still connected to those? I remind people that Osama bin Laden was, was part of the deck of cards. He was the ace of spades. There was a bunch of people connected to Osama bin Laden that wasn't on the terrorist watch list. So just because you're not on the terrorist watch list doesn't mean you don't have terrorist ties. So you, it's it's very dangerous what he's done here by giving amnesty to these individuals, letting them one vote in our, our elections, and 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 two making them permanent citizens of the United States without any vetting at all in that process. That's that's the worst thing he could do. But it's not about. America's security at this point. If that was the case, he would already secure our border. It's about winning elections for the Democrats, and that's what they're doing here. And so, if Trump uh, is elected, is that something that he could overturn and undo very Absolutely. easily? Or, well, it'd be tough, but he could because this isn't coming through legislation. This is coming through a directive order, which is an executive right. order. And any executive order, as we saw, can be overturned by the incoming president. We we've seen that before. It's difficult, though, because once that decision is made, it's very difficult to overturn that decision because a lot of motions, a lot of wills get put in, get into play. Now, he could modify it, right? He could say, we're going to give amnesty to people from X, Y, and Z countries, uh, which would help some of that. And I would, I, I would, I would understand why he is doing that. And amnesty meaning the amnesty to the person that's married to a United States citizen has lived in the United States for 10 years or whatever that period of time is that ends up putting on the final order. But yes, he could technically. Um, is it that simple? No. Okay. Well, uh, last question before we get you out of here, because I know we talked about this a lot on episode, you know, 589 and 599, but the Turks and Caicos situation, obviously you've been, yeah. you know, very, very involved with that situation. So what is the latest on Ryan Watson and him potentially coming home? So we're, we're doing this on, uh, Wednesday, what, the 18th, Wednesday, right? the 19th, so, and this will be coming 19th. out on the 20th. So today, yep. Right now. Uh, as we speak, probably I'm waiting for, um, I may have already had a text message come in on it, but Ryan is at court and he's having a court hearing today. He'll be sentenced on Friday. So, uh, and we expect him to come home. We've already, the law's already changed. Uh, they are now lo no longer enforcing the 12 year minimum. Uh, you know, we spent a lot of time working with the, uh, with London and uh, the Turks on getting some of this stuff changed. Uh, we went down there, met with their AG, met with their, their governor, met with their premier, their sheriff. I like to see the movement that they're making. So now the 12 year minimum doesn't apply. I expect what will happen is Ryan will probably get a fine. You know, I don't know what that fine will be. It may be $6,000 or maybe $9,000. And he may get a suspended sentence. He may get time served and released. But I, I fully expect him to be home Friday night uh, in, in Oklahoma. I think he will. I mean, I talked to him. I, I talk to, I don't talk to him every day, but I talk to him quite often. I talked to him last night. My wife was talking to uh, Valerie Val's, what they call her this morning. Uh, that's his wife. And so my wife, Christy was, and so that we really expect that to happen. Uh, and then there'll be one lady left from the United States from Florida. 
and she will have uh, her hearing and her sentencing. I would, uh, we got it moved up. Uh, she should have, um, I believe her, I believe we'll probably have her home hopefully by the end of this, uh, by the end of this month. So I'd say sometime at next, the end of next week. It may be the first or second week of, of July, but I, I believe we'll have her home in the next week and then we'll be done. Uh, it, hopefully, and they, like I said, they've changed their law now uh, and we, this issue should be put to rest. Okay, well, I know the Mullins and Thompsons have been praying for that family and the other families, and a lot of people in my audience have been uh, praying for them as well. So hopefully this comes to the resolution we've all been hoping for and praying for from the beginning. But Mark Wayne, is there anything else you want to say before we get you out of here? No, brother. You still look sharp. That's my best compliment for the day. That's it. Hey, man, I'm trying to cut people up with my hair cut, that, looking look fresh to death. Going on Isn't there. that good? I mean, hey, hey, how many yeah. hard parts are up there on Capitol Hill? I think we can add one or two more, man. Yeah, zero chance, zero chance. But you make it look as good as a hard part can be. Hey, I'm just going to say the next time I see you, I may or may not have clippers in my hands. All right, Mark Wayne, until next month. <laughs> see you, brother. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And as always, we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>